You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie from the U.S. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. This is the podcast hosted by two online friends who never met in real life and who get together once a week to talk about murder, mystery, and the macabre throughout history. That's right. Before we start, we want to give a quick shout out to all of our new listeners. Welcome. We're so glad you found us. If you make your way through our back catalog, please remember that our audio gets better over time. We also become a little less awkward as we get on, but just like, I'm never not going to be awkward. So I'm, that's what I bring to the table. Also a huge shout out to all of our regular listeners, our YouTube audience and our newest Patreon members. Thank you all sincerely so much. We could not do this without your support and downloads, reviews, recommendations to friends and your Patreon memberships. Sincerely, we really appreciate you so much. As always, for more information on how to contact us, how to support us, or how to join social media, please listen until the end of the episode because that's when we will tell you all about that. Now it's time to talk more about the Clutter family, who were tragically murdered in November 1959 in their home in Holcomb, Kansas. If you haven't listened to last week's episode, please pause this now. Go back to episode 218 and listen to part one first. If you've already listened to part one and just need a quick refresher, we've got that for you now. Everyone who doesn't need a recap, just jump two minutes forward. Here we go. This heinous crime took place on 15th of November 1959 in the small town of Holcomb, Kansas, and left four members of the Clutter family brutally murdered in their rural farmhouse. Herb Clutter, a well-respected farmer, and his wife Bonnie lived with their two teenage children, Nancy and Kenyon, in a peaceful community where violent crime was virtually unheard of. The tranquility of their lives, however, was shattered when two ex-convicts, Richard Dick Eugene Hickok and Perry Edward Smith, entered their home with the intent to rob them. Hickok had heard about the Clutters owning a safe with at least $10,000 in cash at all times in their house, while imprisoned at Lansing Correctional Facility. He heard this from a fellow inmate who had worked as a farmhand on the Clutter farm called River Valley Farm, over a decade earlier. Once Hickok was released from prison on parole, he had hatched a plan to drive to Holcomb, enter the Clutter home, steal the money, and, quote, leave no witness behind, unquote. Dick Hickok and Buddy Perry Smith, who had met in prison and had both a history of criminal activities, mostly petty crime, believed that robbing the Clutters would be an easy and lucrative venture. Upon arriving at the Clutter residence, Hickok and Smith found the family unsuspecting and asleep. Armed with shotguns, they brutally murdered Herb, Bonnie, Nancy and Kenyon in cold blood. The brutality of the crime shocked the small town and reverberated throughout the nation. The murderers left behind a gruesome crime scene with the bodies of the Clutter family members bound and shot at close range. Herb Clutter was the only one who had had his throat cut in addition. And that's pretty much where we left off last week. On Sunday morning, their bodies were found by friends of the family and an immediate investigation was started to find the murder or murderers of the Clutter family. Herb, Bonnie, Nancy and Kenyon were buried on the 18th of November. 1,000 people attended the service, and the First Methodist Church in Garden City was filled with hymns sung by the 48 Voice Choir. From the Garden City Telegram, 18th of November, 1959, page 1, Wednesday. Grieving Community Buries Clutters, by Bill Brown. Quote, A grief-stricken community buried four members of the Herbert W. Clutter family today, in beautiful First Methodist Church, Built under the direction of Herb Clutter, funeral services were conducted for the four, all of whom were murdered in their farm home late Saturday night or early Sunday morning, 
the gray steel caskets bearing the bodies of Herb and his wife Bonnie, daughter Nancy, 16, and son Kenyon, 15, were lined end-to-end across the altar in front of a sanctuary overflowing with relatives, friends, and the many others who paused in final respect to this well-known family. The Reverend Leonard Cowan, pastor of the church, handled the 40-minute service with the aid of a 48-voice chancel choir, which filled the divided choir loft in back of the pulpit. Quote, Our God has not told us we will not suffer sorrow and pain, the minister told the large, hushed congregation, but he has told us he is there to help us bear our burdens. End quote. The pastor was a close friend of those he buried and spoke intimately of the spiritual blessings he has had in his service with the clutters. Quote, if Christ were to return and pick twelve disciples from this church, I am sure Herb Clutter would be among the first, he said. Mr. Cowan said he did not believe that the deaths were the will of God, but that it was a tragedy where the sin of man overcame the goodness of God. Many stood throughout the service, in the wings, down the side aisles, in the stairways, in corridors, but no one was turned away. Following the service, the caskets were taken to four hearses in the street. Nancy was brought out first, followed by her mother, father, and then her brother. Paul Bearer, for the parents, were adult friends. Carrying the two children were both adults and classmates of the two high school students, including. Kenyon's best friend and Nancy's boyfriend Bob, right, I think, were both pallbearers. Continuing, in the large choir were many members who had sang with Nancy Clutter when she was in the choir last year. There were also several of her Methodist Youth Fellowship colleagues, a group in which both the girl and Kenyon had been active. The choir, all under the direction of Alton Foster, sang two numbers. My God and I, and the Lord's Prayer. Only other special music was a duet by Mr. and Mrs. Fielding Hands, who sang Whispering Hope. End quote. As I mentioned before, this quadruple murder was a big shock to not only Holcomb, but basically all of Western Kansas. And the biggest questions that remained on people's minds were who would do such a thing and why? It seemed almost inconceivable that strangers would have come to the farm just like that, entering the house and murdering four innocent people. Nothing was missing, or almost nothing. Kenyon's binoculars and his radio, I think we said it was Nancy's radio last week, but uh, it was probably Kenyon's oh, right. radio, so sorry if, if we made the mistake there. I, I really don't remember. You know how siblings are anyway. It's, who's, <laughs> is it yours? Is it mine? So the the binoculars and the radio were nowhere to be found, but clearly nobody would murder a whole family for just those two items. There was even an envelope with church money on Nancy's desk, untouched. Bonnie had all her, none of her jewelry was missing, for example. I think Nancy's boyfriend, Bobby, was one of the first suspects, which makes absolute sense because he was the last one to see the family alive, as far as investigators knew. And there was talk that Herb hadn't been too happy about Nancy dating Bobby because he was a Catholic while they were Methodists. So did Nancy break things up with Bobby and could that have been a reason for the murders? But Bobby was extremely cooperative with the KBI, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. He even took a lie detector test and he passed. And yes, we know that those tests are not reliable, but... Still, he passed, and it was one of the lead investigators in the case, I think L. Dewey, yeah. who talked to Bobby and dismissed him as a suspect very early on. It didn't matter, though. His reputation was kind of ruined, and his schoolmates would never look at him like before. If I remember correctly, he even had to switch schools because of how he was treated after the murders. And this is something we see over and over again. You know, people are being investigated, but cleared. And yet the public will always look at them as if they are guilty or as if they had at least something to do with it. It's this whole, well, there must be something to the allegations. The police wouldn't just suspect them for nothing mindset. Yeah. And it's bullshit. Oh, yeah. yeah. His story is so particularly sad for me. He very mm. obviously was head over heels in love with Nancy. 
And in that same documentary you mentioned last week about the Clutter family, there's a lot of audio talking about how hard it was going to the funeral and how he was sort of sat on the end pew right right next to her casket. Mm -hmm. And he still sounded upset, like as an old man in the audio. It's just not something you get over. And I just find it so devastating that he then had to change schools. Also, he was very swoony, very swoony, like handsome, handsome, swoony, swoony boy. Yes, Nancy. Yes. Beautiful couple, (laughs) those two. Yeah, Yeah, I think it's okay to say that. Who's going to be offended by us talking about their grandpa being swoony? Also, one of the early theories was that Herb Clutter must have had an enemy. Perhaps someone in the farming community might have felt wronged by Herb. You know, the fear of this being some form of revenge murder went as far as the second oldest daughter changing her name weeks before her wedding, out of fear that someone could possibly come for her. There were also other rumors about affairs and grudges against the family and so on. I I don't think it's necessary to go into details because ultimately it's a lot of speculation, rumors, and we all know now that none of it had anything to do with the murders. That's right. So let's talk about the crime scene and what investigators found and sort of had to work with. Nancy was found in her room, lying on her bed, facing the wall. She was wearing her pajamas and a bathrobe. Her hands were tied at her wrists behind her back, and that looked like it was a piece of cord belonging to the Venetian blinds, is what they used to tie her. Her ankles were also tied up, and she had a shotgun wound to the back of her head. There was blood on the furniture and the wall around her, and it looked as though she had been shot at very close range. One of the reasons, I think, also that her her boyfriend was a suspect, is this right, Johanna, am I remembering correctly, was that she was the only one who had been shot from behind, so she wouldn't have even seen it coming. And so there was some thought, which I can, again, you can understand why. Yeah, that the, the murderer had kind of connection to her. Didn't, and want, didn't to want to see her. Exactly. Exactly, didn't want to see her face. Exactly. And I think yeah. it was just because she was such a pretty young girl. She was a hard one to, you know. In the main bedroom at the end of the hall on the upper floor, they found Bonnie's body. She was also on her bed and her hands were tied, but in front, not in the back. The cord that tied her wrists ran down to her ankles, tying them together as well. And then all of that was tied to the footboard. She was wearing a white nightgown and was killed by a shot to the side of the head. Kenyon was found in the basement, lying on a sofa. He was the only one not wearing pajamas, but instead had on jeans and a white t-shirt. He had been tied in the same way as Bonnie, cord tied up to the couch that he was laying on. Herb was found in the basement as well. He was found lying on a big piece of cardboard in the furnace room. The cardboard had been... We don't want to say that the cardboard had been moved on the floor for comfort because these people were... You know, this was... It seems messed up to say, like, oh, they were making them comfortable before they ruthlessly murdered them, but that's kind of what happened, right? Like, they put a pillow under Kenyon's head, too. Yeah, I think that's the theories that they kind of... Which was this weird uh, dichotomy. It also suggests maybe that one of them really did think they were just tying them up and robbing them, and the other one, you know. yeah, Herb... So he's found on this piece of cardboard, and it's so bloody. It's the most bloody of the scenes, and he went through the worst of it. And this is another reason why many believe that this may have been a revenge killing or someone holding a grudge, because why else would there be so much anger taken out on Herb compared to the rest of the family? Herb was wearing his striped PJs and his mouth was taped. It was done by wrapping the tape around his head, which is awful. There was a pipe over his head and on it was a piece of cord that indicated that at one point during the ordeal, he had been tied to the pipe. All right, what else did they find? Even though Kenyon was not wearing his pajamas, it looked as though he was about to go to bed 
or had already been in bed because his glasses were found in the bedroom, and he always had his glasses on. Yeah, and I think everybody who wears glasses knows it's the last thing you you take off. Exactly. If you really rely on your glasses, it's the last thing you take off before you go to bed. Exactly. Yeah. I wondered whether he'd maybe just fallen asleep in his clothes, you know, and so when possible. you're a teenager yeah. and you're just wearing jeans and a t-shirt, yeah. maybe. Everyone else was in their sleeping attire already, so it was assumed that the intruders had entered the home while everyone, or almost everyone, was asleep. Also, there was no sign of the family members fighting back. There were no signs of a struggle, no defense wounds. So it really looked as though they followed the instructions given by the intruder or intruders, probably thinking that if they just cooperated, they would not be harmed. Nancy's jewelry, we think it was found hidden in one of her shoes in the closet, which indicated that maybe she had had enough time to hide what was valuable to her before the intruders entered her bedroom. I think I remember that from the book, if I'm not mistaken, that she that they found a necklace or something in her shoe. The biggest clue, though, came from the photos taken at the crime scene. It was something that wasn't really visible with the naked eye. At least part of it wasn't visible with bare eyes, it, because there were two sets of shoe prints from two different shoes, which let them know that there were at least two intruders. Both prints were on the cardboard that was found under Herb Clutter's body. One was the print of a boot. Apparently, one of the murderers had stepped into the blood of their victim. It showed something that looked like two circles in the sole imprint. And from what we could figure out, it looked like a popular brand of rubber sole that showed these kind of circles. I kept looking at the photo of the imprint, right? And I tried to understand why it kept getting referred to as cat paw, cat's paw heels. Yeah. Uh, it looks nothing like a cat paw to me. No. <laughs> Until I realized that cat paws was, or is, I think was, but you can still get some on eBay, if I'm not mistaken. It was a popular manufacturer for rubber soles in the US, and their slogan, one of the slogans was, cat paws won't slip. I even messaged Annie and I said, explain to me cat paws. And I was like, I don't know. Cat, cat's paw. What was it? Cat's cat paw, paw soles or cat's paw. Yeah. And I, I'd never heard of it. And so then we had to look into it a little bit. I guess they were more popular in the, in the mid-century. Yeah. I'm sure loads US, of people yeah. immediately know. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just not, n neither of us did. So let us tell you about them. This is an explanation from Heddles.com titled A Brief History of Cat's Paw Heels. Quote, supposedly, if you put your hand up in a flat fist and made a swipe like a house cat batting an imaginary ball of string in shoe repair circles in mid-century America, the room would chant back, cat's paw. Oh, would it really? <laughs> Tell us, listeners. The cult status of the rubber heel and sole manufacturer has long been a part of the American lexicon. Amelia Earhart supposedly died wearing a pair of cat's paw heeled loafers. <laughs> cat's paw was founded in Baltimore as Cat's Paw Rubber Company in 1904. The main draw of the heel was in its no-slip rubber pads embedded in the heel. These little white studs were made of a different material and recessed slightly into the rubber. The wearer's weight would extend the pad and added extra traction. Aside from the telltale white dots, cat's paw also have these asymmetrical semicircles at the rounded edge of the heel. They almost are instantly recognizable on vintage footwear, but one of the most compelling reasons for continued interest in this otherwise blip of a mid-century brand is the packaging. Famed German graphic designer Lucian Bernhard, father of the Bernhard font, designed the logo in 1941. The swiping cat on the bright red box sums up everything we'd like to imagine about post-war American quaintness. It was ripped off wholesale by Black Cat Bioworks. And <laughs> I love how it's like post-American quaintness. And then the last thing, it's like it was then ripped off wholesale by Black Cat Fireworks, which is, again, such an American thing to do. <laughs> I found it very interesting, though, especially the part about Amelia Earhart. Yeah. Now I wonder how well it works on ice, because we have a lot of ice here in winter, which is scary to me every time I walk the dogs, especially with jam. Oh, yeah. 
I have never heard of such souls at all. No, I have also never heard of them. Do you get the little cramp? Are they called crampons? Those little spikes that attach to your snow boots for ice? Well, I don't have them, but every winter I think I should get them. You should. Every single time. And then once the ice is gone, I'm completely forgetting about it until the next year. And I'm like, damn it. Past me. No, you need to just get a pair of like dog walking boots and then stick those suckers on there and just leave them all the time. So they're just ready to go. You yeah. Know? Uh, so the bloody shoe print was showing the typical cat's paw circles. And the other shoe print, that was really only visible in the photographs. So there were imprints, but you couldn't really notice them until you saw them in photos, right? Pure luck. He didn't see them when he was taking the photo, just when, when he um, when developed When he developed them. them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Very lucky. And it was when the photos were developed that they could see that the other pair of shoes had diamond print on the sole. So now, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, a.k.a. the KBI, they knew that there was more than one perpetrator. They still had no idea who they were and why they had done it. They also, by the way, the KBI kept the findings of the shoe prints quiet. They did not inform the media about it because they were worried the murderers would get rid of the shoes if they knew that they recognized them, which was a very smart move. Yeah. So the most valuable lead came by the beginning of December, roughly three weeks after the murders, by a prisoner. And we mentioned him last week already, the one who's basically responsible for all that, uh, Floyd Wells. He had read about the Clutter murders in the newspaper and immediately had a feeling that Hickok had put his plan to action. There was a newspaper that offered $1,000 reward for any tips leading to the arrest of the Clutter family murderers. Mm -hmm. And now I wonder if that was his kind of main reason for coming forward. And then I also wonder, did he get the money? Because I hope not. I agree. So anyhow, Wells asked to talk to the warden and the warden had contacted the KBI. And the KBI sent a man to Lansing to talk to Wells and see what he knew. And this is what he wrote in his report. Quote, The prisoner who told me this story worked for the Clutters during 1948 and 1949. His name is Floyd Wells, a white male, 32 years old, 5'8", weighs 148 pounds, medium build, dark complexion. Wells was a cellmate to Richard Hickok, 28 years old, 5'10", weighs 150 pounds, has blue eyes and brown hair. These two men spent long hours visiting with each other as most all cellmates do. During these conversations, Wells related how he enjoyed working in Western Kansas and what wonderful people the Clutters were. He told Hickok about the Clutters' financial standing, and it wasn't long before he noticed his experiences with the Clutters greatly fascinated his cellmate. Wells told Hickok that Mr. Clutter had a safe in the old house and that he remembers telling Hickok that he saw Mr. Clutter pay a large lumber bill from this safe during construction as the new Clutter farm home neared completion in 1949, and that Mr. Clutter told him that he paid out more than $10,000 in cash from the safe that one particular day, end quote. Wells' sworn and signed statement reads, quote, The Clutters were all good to me, and Mr. Clutter, a very well-to-do man financially, was very generous to me, always giving me a bonus when the work was extra heavy or the hours extra long. I was very close to Mr. Clutter and liked to visit with him Sundays, evenings and other times when we weren't working. I spent considerable time with him in his den or office where he had a desk and I believe a safe. This was in the old house where the Clutters lived in 1949. I remember just a short time before I left the Clutters, I remember Mr. Clutter paying a large lumber bill and I thought he paid in cash with money from the safe. The reason I remember is because Mr. Clutter made the remark to me that evening when he left his den that he paid out more than $10,000 that day. End quote. The KBI agent continues, quote, William Floyd Wells won't back up an inch on his statement regarding the safe, which he said was in the den or office which was located in the basement of the old Clutter farm home. In the statement, which I took this morning, every opportunity was given to Wells to wiggle out of his statement about the safe, even suggested that perhaps he was mistaken and that the money was locked in Mr. Clutter's desk, but he wouldn't change his mind. He got insistent as hell when I suggested that he could be mistaken about the safe, and he said, now Wick, uh, Wick, Ursig, a hand on a Clutter's farm. 
knows that safe and was there and if it isn't there now he probably helped move it out as he was going to move into the house after the clutters moved into the new house. Wells continued by further describing the safe. He said it was a real safe. It was big, black, heavy and it had a dial on it and that it wasn't just a metal strongbox locked with a key like valuable papers are kept in just for fire protection. Wells said that he isn't sure but he believed the safe had wheels at each corner and if it doesn't have wheels at each corner it has heavy iron legs under it. He said that he bet if the safe isn't in the same location at this time you could tell exactly where it was located and be sure a safe had been there because as heavy as it was there would be markings on the floor where it stood and that the floor would be marked up by moving the safe and moving it out if it has been moved out because it was really heavy. Wells said that he told Hickok that the Clutters had a safe when he worked for the family, but they were building a new home when he left their employ. He said he told Hickok that he knew of no safe in the new home. He said that he knew nothing at all about the new home, end quote. I think it's needless to say that there was no safe in the in the new home. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have a safe. I think there. also people can make the mistake that because... Yeah, maybe they had paid out $100,000 in a day because they had saved that money and knew they were going to have to pay all exactly. those payments because they had saved and planned they knew to build the house. The, the lumber guy would be coming that day, so okay, I go to the bank, pick up the money, have right. it locked, and then pay it out the same day. Why would you assume that somebody has $10,000 at least in their safe at all times? At all time, exactly. Almost all of us have at some point in our lives had something valuable in our possession, have had a sum of cash. You yeah. know what I mean? Doesn't necessarily mean it's ours to do with what we want. Yeah. You know, that supposition is just wild to me. It would be like when I used to have to drop off deposits from a bar at a bank, right? Like at the end of a night. Exactly. Yeah. And if somebody saw me with, at the, the bank depositing cash and they just assumed that I was loaded. Or if you plan to buy a car yeah, in cash, okay, you pick up That's the money right. from the bank, but that doesn't yeah. mean you always have that kind of money lying around. At yeah, home. now I have nothing in my bank until the next time. This yeah. is the thing, the, the audacity and the assumption. So the KBI, they finally have a promising lead. Now, in recent years, there have been documents discovered that indicated that it took the KBI five days to finally go to Hickok's parents' farm and look for him. And there's been a lot of criticism about that, and we're going to talk more about that in the end. But I think it's safe to say that for whatever reason, it took the KBI several days to get the ball rolling after they spoke to Wells. I don't think it was due to negligence or because they didn't care. They definitely did care to find the culprits. It was just, we don't know. Exactly. Whatever the reason was, maybe they needed some warrants or, you know, I, I have no idea. Yeah, I also don't know. But I'm sure they were not like, I don't care. Yeah, whatever. I don't think they were just like, well, let's just take a few days off before we sink our teeth yeah. into this <laughs> next thing. You know, that's not really how it works. So, okay, they finally go looking for Hickok at his family's home, but he's not there. And when they ask his mother about his whereabouts and his movements on the 14th and 15th of November, she told them that he had a friend over, a man named Perry Smith, and that they had made a trip to Fort Scott in order to visit Smith's sister, who lived there. This was obviously a lie that they made up because Perry Smith's sister did not live in Fort Scott, and also she didn't want anything to do with her brother because he was creepy and he scared her, and she did not even want him to know where she lived. Mm. That's never a good sign, right? mm, -mm. After the alleged trip to Fort Scott, Hickok had returned the next day and then gone to work on Monday as usual, but he had left on the 21st of November and had not returned since. When searching the Hickok property, the investigators found a bloody shirt and a shotgun. They took that with them for ballistic testing. Next, they went to Hickok's boss. He told the KBI agents that Hickok had come to work on November 20th and that when he left work on that day, Hickok had said, See you in the morning. 
that they did not see him in the morning. He did not come back the next day. And <laughs> narrator, but he did in fact not see yeah, him in the morning. He was like, I'll see you tomorrow, <laughs> but they did not see him tomorrow. Nope. An arrest warrant for Smith and Hickok was issued immediately. But where were they? Well, after the murders, they had started to cash bad checks. Their original plan had been to flee to Mexico, right? But back then they thought they would do so with at least $10,000. And now all they had were a couple of hundred dollars, a transistor radio and binoculars. On the 23rd of November, they arrived in Mexico, heading toward Mexico City. What they hadn't anticipated was that with barely any money, they would not be able to lay low for long. They even sold the radio and binoculars, and I think also their car. Yeah, I think so. In order to be able to afford a few days more down there, but unfortunately... That money was soon gone again. Or fortunately for, for the KBI. Or fortunately for, yeah, obviously. And so they decided to head back up north. On December 15th, they arrive in California. And because they had sold their car and were mostly on the bus or hitchhiking, they decided to pack up most of their belongings and mail them to Las Vegas, where Perry Smith had his official residency at the time. Among the stuff they mailed were also the boots Perry Smith had worn the night of the murders, those cat paw boots. The plan was somehow to get a lot of money through fraud or robbery or whatever means necessary, and then fly to Brazil. Today, there's an extradition treaty between Brazil and the U.S. that was signed in 1961 and went into effect in 1963. But in 1959, they would not have been extradited back to the U.S., so they hitchhiked all the way from California to Iowa, that's roughly 1,600 miles or 2,500 kilometers. Once in Iowa, they stole a car, and then they drove it back to Kansas City. This shows that they honestly had absolutely no idea what they were doing, and they also had no idea what the police was doing and that the police was already aware of their existence. Yeah, honestly, the amount of keep your cool and hope for the best energy that that we've seen, I haven't seen this much since Chowchilla. It just yeah. never ceases to amaze me. That's all I could think about with, with these guys was those Chowchilla notes. But I'm always more of a panic internally and plan for every catastrophic possibility kind of girl, you know, different strokes. Richard Hickok once more started cashing bad checks. He managed to get $500 that way, which is more than five grand today. But the police were not far behind. They were contacted by a furniture store that had a bad check that had been cashed the night before, and the employees there identified Richard Hickok without a doubt. Then they received a call from a nearby service station that Hickok had just been there trying to cash another check. The person there knew Hickok and knew about his fraudulent ways and immediately called the police. So the police were now on the lookout in the area, but they couldn't find Hickok or the described car anywhere. Yeah, what the police didn't know was that they were already on their way to Florida. They spent Christmas there. Now remember that we told you a couple of minutes ago that the KBI lately got under a bit of scrutiny for letting too much time pass between the Floyd Wells testimony and visiting the Hickok home. Well, one of the criticism is about another murdered family in Florida, the Walker family, who were murdered on 19th of December 1959 in Sarasota, Florida. This is a cold case. The culprits were never found. Might be a standalone episode eventually. I'm not sure yet. But there are some who believe, including the Sarasota law enforcement, that Smith and Hickok could have something to do with the murder of Cliff and Christine Walker and their two very young children. And so the reason why some people are upset with the KBI is that they feel that if they would have followed the Floyd Wells lead sooner, Richard Hickok and Perry Smith would not have been able to make it to Florida. Very similar parallel to Jorn van der Sloot and murdering Stephanie Ramirez mm -hmm. after. Yeah, true. So this excerpt from the Herald Tribune article titled Did In Cold Blood Killers Murder Sarasota's Walker Family in 59? by Shannon McFarland, explains the possible connection. Quote, After the killings of the Clutter family, the duo took off to Mexico, California, the Ozarks, and east to Florida. 
By the time they arrived in the panhandle sometime in December, they were running out of money. Time and again throughout Florida, the men were seen at auto shops and gas stations looking for work as mechanics. They drove a 1956 Chevy Bel Air, the same model the Walker family wanted to buy. In the two days leading up to the Walker murders, they were spotted at least 12 times in the Sunshine State. In Tallahassee on December 17th, they traded their tires for old ones and $20, then sold an Olympic TV for $50 at the Tip Top Cafe. In Sarasota, on December 17th, they asked if anyone needed auto painting at a gas station at Cattleman and Fruit Wheel Roads. Later, they asked to fix a man's bumper on 21st Street. We do good work, one of the men said. They stayed the night in a Miami Beach hotel on December 18th, asked for a refund the next morning and left. On December 19th, the day of the killings, they shopped at Grant's department store in Sarasota. The next morning, Smith and Hickok were seen three times in Arcadia and Nocatee. One of them, witnesses recall, had a scratched up face and welts on his forehead. End quote. Yeah, they're the worst, huh? They're horrible. Also, I wonder now what, what they use as an excuse to get a refund on the hotel. I do too. Bed bugs, probably. Maybe. Cockroaches? Cockroaches, no warm water. Lizards. Smith and Hickok left Florida drove up north to South Carolina and then west through Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and then on to Texas and Arizona. The new plan was to head to Las Vegas, and they finally arrived just before New Year's. On the 30th of December, around 5 p.m., Hickok and Smith stopped their car in front of a Las Vegas post office, and Perry Smith went in to retrieve the packages they had sent to themselves weeks prior. A patrol car noticed the Kansas license plate. They were well informed about the two men wanted in a Kansas homicide, and they soon realized that the license plate on that car had been reported stolen and did in fact not belong to the car that they were currently on. The police officers decide to just wait and watch from a distance as Perry Smith left the post office carrying a package and got back into the car. As the two suspects drove away, the police car followed and then stopped them a few blocks away. A short while later, Al Dewey, the KBI investigator, received a phone call at home. Perry Smith and Richard Hickok had been arrested, finally, six weeks after the murders. And the best thing? The package Smith had just picked up before his arrest contained boots with the cat paw soles. Imagine they would have been arrested before they could pick up the package. Then I think this very important evidence might have been forever gone. Agreed. It was very, very lucky and smart that everything went down the way that it did. Dewey and the other investigators flew to Vegas to talk to Smith and Hickok and eventually drive them back to Kansas. Once they arrived in Las Vegas, the KBI agents interrogated the two suspects separately. Hickok started talking almost immediately heavily incriminating his partner in crime, saying that Smith had pulled the trigger on the four victims and that he had nothing to do with killing the family. He was just there for the robbery, for the money in the safe that never existed. Perry Smith stayed quiet until they were driven back to Kansas. The two were in separate cars, and when he caught a glimpse of Richard Hickok chatting away with the agents, he finally started talking as well. This is from the Garden City Telegram, 4th of January, 1960, page 1. Hickok confesses part in slaying. Fantastic story is unraveled. Quote, They entered the unlocked door of Herb Clutter's office, which is on the west end of the modern two-story home. They found Clutter in bed in the only first-floor bedroom just off to the north of the office. After Clutter apparently told them he had no safe, They took him upstairs, where Mrs. Bonnie Clutter, 45, and the Clutter children, Kenyon, 15, and Nancy, 16, were either in bed or about ready to get in. All four were locked in the upstairs bathroom while Smith searched the house. Hickok apparently stood guard upstairs. It was during the search that Smith took the portable radio from Kenyon's room and placed it outside in the car used by the killers. Following the search, Clutter was taken from the upstairs bathroom to the basement where he was tied up. Kenyon was taken to the basement next and tied to a pipe. 
Lawmen found strands of cord on an overhead sewer pipe near the body of Clutter and had assumed Clutter was tied to the pipe rather than his son. Then, Mrs. Clutter and Nancy were taken to their respective bedrooms upstairs and tied to their beds. Hickok said Clutter was killed first by cutting his throat. Then Kenyon was shot in the head with a shotgun, and they returned to Clutter and also shot him in the head. The woman and the girl were killed last, both shot in the head while in their beds upstairs. The pair then left the house and drove away in the car in which they arrived. End quote. Can you imagine how terrifying for those women to hear those gunshots? I can't. Horrible. So the trial took place in Garden City and started on 22nd of March 1960, so not even four months after their arrest. That's very quick in my opinion. It is. I think nowadays it would take way longer, right, to prepare for the trial. I think they did a great job. Yep. So the defense tried to get the two accused to be deemed unfit for trial, but Judge Tate denied the defense requests for thorough psychological testing of Smith and Hickok. Instead, he appointed three local general practitioners who were not psychiatrists to conduct a brief examination. Following the interview, these doctors deemed the defendants mentally sound. And despite the defense's efforts to consult a more experienced psychiatrist from the state mental hospital, whose diagnosis suggested signs of mental illness in Smith and a possible impact of Hickok's past head injuries on his behavior, this opinion was actually not presented in the Finney County Courthouse during the trial. I'm not really sure if we've discussed the McNaughton test on the episode, uh, in an episode previously, but just in case, the McNaughton test was named after a landmark legal case in England in 1843. It's a legal standard used to determine an individual's sanity when they have committed a crime. Usually, the defendant must lack the ability to understand what they were doing at the time of the crime and be unable to comprehend the consequences or that their actions were morally or legally wrong. If the defendant is found to be insane, they may be deemed not criminally responsible for their actions. Instead of facing a traditional criminal conviction and punishment, like prison, they may be instead subject to psychiatric treatment, confinement to a mental institution, or something similar to treat their mental health needs while protecting the public. We should note that the McNaughton test has been subject to criticism and modification over time. Some legal systems have introduced additional standards or refined the criteria for determining insanity in criminal cases. In the Hickok-Smith trial, the McNaughton test was strictly applied to determine sanity. And according to this test, a defendant is considered sane if they have enough mental capacity to understand their actions at the time of committing a crime, recognize it as wrong, and acknowledge that it violates the victim's rights. In adherence to Kansas law, the psychiatrist was only permitted to offer an opinion on the defendant's sanity or lack thereof, specifically during their time in the clutter house. Due to this limitation, the psychiatrist could only affirm Hickok's sanity based on the McNaughton definition. However, he was unable to provide insights into Smith's state of mind during the killings. And furthermore, the psychiatrist was not allowed to comment on whether Perry Smith possessed the mental ability to control his actions, irrespective of his awareness that they were unlawful. The verdict came in on 29th of March 1960, and the two were found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. I think the jurors only took like 30 minutes to come to a verdict. They were pretty much sure that the two had done it. It was, the the evidence was clear in this one. It wasn't a hard decision to make. And I mean, they had confessed. Exactly. Not that there aren't cases where people confess to things they haven't done. Oh, no, no. It just everything, they had everything they needed in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Richard Hickok complained to the Kansas Bar Association that the trial wasn't fair, which led to an investigation of the trial. There were several complaints, like um, one was the trial had not been moved away from Finney County. And I kind of agree. I think a fair trial should not take place in the community of the victims if it can be avoided. I think that's, that's, it's hard to have a fair trial if it's a juror trial where the, the jurors are from that community. Right. Although I don't know how far they'd have had to go in this case. It was... It's true. Yeah. Also, they had one juror who made statements against the death penalty in this case. So also that was kind of a problem, apparently. So all this led to four appeals and delays in carrying out the death sentence. 
Uh, some expert lawyers tried three times to get the Hickok-Smith case heard by the Supreme Court, but each time the court was like, nope, no need for that. It's all pretty clear. Yeah, I think it was pretty clear. I don't think either of them would have met the legal definition of insane at any time. There definitely are contributing factors, but they both knew it was wrong when they planned, committed, and then tried to hide their crimes. I completely agree. Violent, 100%. Sociopathic tendencies, yep, most likely, but not criminally insane, in my opinion. I'm not an expert, but yeah, I think... I think it's very hard to claim insanity if you try to hide what you did. Because yeah. if you're hiding it, you know it was wrong. So finally, on 14th of April 1965, five years after they were found guilty, Hickok and Smith were hanged at the Kansas State Penitentiary in Lansing. Perry Smith and Richard Hickok's last meals, for those of you who are interested in these kind of things, consisted of vanilla ice cream, deep fried jumbo shrimp, uh, french fries, onion rings, garlic bread, shortcake, strawberries, and whipped cream, and Coke and 7-Up. I honestly think this could have easily been a three-part episode, to be honest, because there's so much more that we haven't even touched upon yet. <sighs> their time in prison, their, their time on death row. There are theories out there that the murders were not committed to cover up a robbery gone wrong, but because the two were hired to murder Herb Glutter and his family specifically. There are books out there, you can read up on it. Some of the evidence provided in online forums, for example, are, I want to say, a bit outlandish to me. Like one I read was like, well, Herb Glutter was not such an upstanding man because Nancy wrote in her diary that he had started smoking secretly. Yeah, that says nothing about his character, though, because if every person who sneaks a cigarette now and then, probably because they are stressed... In 1959? Yeah, would be considered a flawed character, then, yeah, good night world. But it's probably, again, this idea, and I talked about it a lot in the Natasha Kampusch yeah. case... So many times. ...how a perfect victim has to be absolutely flawless, which is such a pet peeve of mine. It's such nonsense. It really makes us angry, especially at that time. Mm. I mean... You know, doctors recommended different cigarettes, you yeah. know, but I, I obviously I agree. We hate victim blaming. It's always the wrong move, almost always the wrong move. So the next thing, the last thing, really, I think we need to talk about, at least briefly, is Truman Capote's involvement in all of this. So in 1959, very shortly after the murders, he was in New York City and he was reading the newspaper when he stumbled upon an article that immediately caught his interest. It was a rather short article about the mysterious murder of a farmer and his family in Holcomb, Kansas. And Capote said, He thought about this article for the rest of the day, and then he thought about it a little bit more the next day. And then he was like, I'm going to go to Kansas and write an article about how this crime impacted the small farming community. A whole day and a half he thought about that case, and he wrote a book about it. I, it made an impression on him. I mean, I get it, but like... He was like, I thought about it for a whole day and a half. It was driving me mad. And it's like, how long have we been thinking about Hinterkaifeck or Jean Benet or, you know, pick your yeah, poison? Yeah. It's just wild. It's just funny to me. I get at the time it would have been a whole day and a half, man. So, yeah, he was accompanied by one of his best friends, Nell Harper Lee, the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. And I think he must have been quite the spectacle when he arrived in this small town. He was a very flamboyant writer, small stature, high-pitched voice, huge scarf around his neck. At first, the locals wanted nothing to do with him, but he managed to befriend Al Dewey and his family. He and Harper Lee were even at the Dewey residence when the call about the arrest came in. I think that's how he got, like, a lot of inside information. Just hanging around at the Dewey house? Yeah. And I think they liked they liked Truman Capote and um He was that's how he was uh, charming. Yeah. I think without befriending El Dewey, I think he wouldn't have had enough information to write. So the much book. luck with everybody. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And at first it was just supposed to be an article and it was supposed to center around the victims and around Holcomb. But once the arrest was made and Capote got to meet Hickok and Smith the tone of the whole project shifted. And I think it's very clear once you read the book that Truman Capote had a real soft spot for Perry Smith. While Richard Hickok comes across as more brutal and a void of empathy. 
Capote really paints Smith in a more favorable light. And this is also one of the issues many people have with the book. It shows too much empathy for the murderers. And in Capote's case, they might have a point. I mean, we occasionally get unhappy reviews or messages from people who think that our sympathy for, especially our sympathy for killers who are sincerely mentally ill, is unwarranted. We disagree. And as we say all the time, you know, it helps to understand why the crime happened, but it doesn't ever excuse it. I feel like Capote sort of excuses it a little bit. I don't think he excuses it. And I I wouldn't say that we have sim- so much sympathy. I agree. But I think, I think Truman Capote saw a lot of himself in Perry Smith. Not that Truman Capote was violent or, or that he would have killed somebody. Very, yeah. But I think, I think he saw this kind of vulnerable artistic side to Perry Smith that he had experienced when he was a boy. Yeah, there was a and very... And felt maybe isolated. Agreed. Yeah, like a very there, but for the grace of God go I. Like if my life had been a little different, this could be me, I think is was sort of yeah. his feeling about Smith. But yeah, yeah. I get it. I also think the book and Truman Capote's involvement made the case way bigger than it probably would have been without him. Definitely it made the murderers more known. I mean, fashion photographer Richard Avedon took their portraits while they were on death row, which is such a mindfuck to me. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, not a fan. Already mentioned it last week. I read the books many, many times. I think first time around the age of 19. And I remember back then the sympathy that was shown towards Perry Smith appealed to me as a teenager. You know, when you're younger, you're inclined to be more empathetic towards undeserving people that you see as kind of an outsider, for example. Don't get me wrong, the life of Hickok and Smith is tragic in many ways, yet over the years I learned to save my empathy more for the people who deserve it. I I don't know if I express myself or my thoughts correctly here. I hope that makes sense. It does. I can understand that people, especially friends and family of the victims, don't need a book that focuses too much on the murderers being a victim of their circumstances. But a book that focuses on the real victims is all I'm trying to say. I agree completely. I agree completely. And like I said, you know, it helps us understand it. We all as a community want to know why and how these things yeah. happen, right? That's why these books are written. That's why people buy the books. That's why we're licky loose. That's why you're listening to this podcast right now. Like as a community, we want to know how did this happen? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? How do we make our community safe? How are we all, because this could be anybody, right? So yeah, I was never a huge fan of the book. I preferred his created characters. I'm more of a Holly Golightly fan. Mm. The other issue, and if you listen to our Amityville coverage, you know how much it gets my goat, that In Cold Blood is marketed as non-fiction, in a way. Well, non-fiction novel, novel. which a I find such an novel. interesting thing to say. Yeah. Right? A complete factual report. Capote himself said in an interview about the book, quote, I got this idea of doing a really serious big work. It would be precisely like a novel, with a single difference. Every word of it would be true from beginning to end, end quote. And that's not entirely true. We talked last week about how the family says that the portrayal of Bonnie, in particular, is not factual, but there are more things that are not 100% true. Where Truman took liberties, the relatives of the Clutter family counted more than 40 inconsistencies when it comes to the victims and their life on the River Valley farm. Some are really minor things, like if a horse was a workhorse or if it was sometimes used to ride on. That's, I mean, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. But it's still not 100% factual. Yeah, also, for example, um, in the book, the KBI acts immediately after Wells' testimony and one of the KBI agents drives there alone to the Hickok farm and confronts the parents, which also did not happen. Like this also would be very stupid for a KBI or for, for any uh, investigator to, to go there alone. Mm-hmm. That's not how things are done. So these kind of things. I personally, I, I still think it's a fantastic book, even though I developed some grievances with it over the years. And also there is no disputing that Truman Capote poured his heart and soul into the book. 
so much so that it was really damaging to him. Uh, Truman Capote experienced significant emotional and psychological toll after writing In Cold Blood. The process of researching and writing the book took several years, during which he became deeply involved with the people and events surrounding the Glutter family murders, but also the two murderers. He formed a close bond with the killers and spent extensive time interviewing them on death row. And I, I, I get it. I know how hard it sometimes is for us to read about these cases. Mm -hmm. And then imagine for years and years being in contact with the, the very same people who murdered four innocent people. Yeah, I think that's my issue with the book is I just wish it was more about the people murdered and less about the yeah. murderers. Like it almost made them at like a celebrity because Avedon, photo, yeah. you know... It's it just, did, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing. I just don't like it. I mean, there are still people in the documentary, they interview the, the groundskeeper of the cemetery at Lansing where they are buried. And he says that people from all over the world, not, not often, but at times come yeah. and ask for their graves. And he's like, he doesn't get it. And he even asked one tourist from the UK, well, did you also visit the, the Clutter family uh, gravesite because that would make more sense. It would. I could see going to both. Like if you went to see the Clutter family graves, then I think it's normal to want to follow up and see their graves too. But again, it's like, who's the focus? Who's it really about? Because it should be the Clutters. Yeah. I think without the book, almost nobody would remember Hickman no. and Smith as names. Agree. Yeah. Uh, nobody who wasn't involved. Yeah. Yep. The emotional impact of immersing himself in the details of the brutal murders and the lives of those affected, coupled with the stress uh, of the lengthy writing process, and he had to wait. Well, he knew the book is going to end with the execution of, of Hickok and Smith, and he had formed some kind of connection with them. I don't want to call it a relationship. But yeah, it had profound effects on Capote. He struggled with depression, substance abuse, and there was a whole lot of expectations surrounding the book. The whole experience also took a toll on his friendship with Harper Lee. The publication of In Cold Blood in 1966 was met with critical acclaim and commercial success, solidifying Capote's reputation as a groundbreaking author. However, the toll it took on him emotionally contributed to a decline in his mental health, and he had a lot of substance abuse issues in the ne over the next years. Capote struggled to replicate the success of In Cold Blood and faced a lot of challenges in completing subsequent projects. I think he never wrote a novel after that. No, I, I think could so. be wrong. Yeah. The emotional aftermath of writing In Cold Blood is definitely often cited as a factor in Capote's personal and professional struggles later in life. And despite his literary achievements, the psychological consequences of delving into such a haunting and tragic story left a lasting impact on Truman Capote. And he died, I think, at the age of 59. Yeah. And I do often wonder what would have happened had he not taken this particular path and written this particular book. Yeah. You know, this case would have been just another of those that we come across when we're reading old papers, This these tragic stories that we hear. There's no question that Capote was an incredibly talented and sensitive soul. I just wished he'd, I just often wish he'd stuck to more of his stories that came from his own mind, you know, and what, how yeah. things would have been different. Yeah. What surprised me, they interviewed a friend of him and he said that uh, Capote said after the execution that broke something in him, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, I can't live without them. Yeah. Which is like, hmm, I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah, I mean, I think he had some of his own mental health issues and, yeah. you know, really got too entangled with that whole situation. Another thing I found really interesting in the cold, uh, in the cold blooded documentary, there was a newsreel from someone reporting from Lansing from the day of the execution, at the day of the execution, and the reporter had witnessed the two hangings, and he said something like that, and again, paraphrasing, uh, he said something like, I saw babies being born, and I saw purpose in it, I saw people die under the most horrific circumstances, and yet I still saw purpose in it, but what I saw today, I saw no purpose in it. And I find that interesting because there is, of course, a whole discussion to be had about the death penalty, but also how so many people 
families of victims included have talked about how the execution of the murderers didn't help in any way. There was no purpose. Yep. That would be such an interesting topic if anybody out there has personal experience with this. It would be so fascinating yeah. to talk to you about this experience because I was struck by that too, and I agree. The older I get, I think that the more I the older I get, the more I think the death penalty mostly punishes not the person who's actually being put to death, but their family. Like, once they're killed, it's over for them. Yep, but now you're torturing the people who loved that person. Because even if they're a sociopath and just the worst, they still maybe have a mom or a sister or kids even. You know what I mean? So they're gone. Their, their role in all of it is over. But now you've sort of hurt innocent people again, you know? And I totally understand why... At the time this all happened, the Clutter family hoped to never hear about the case again. They just wanted it to go away because it was so painful, yeah. which is sort of how Halifax felt, right? Like, people just didn't talk about it because it was too painful. For a long time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just glad that we've been able to echo back the information found by those who have since set the record straight on how really yeah. loving and vibrant... Bonnie was in the Clutter family, in the documentary, the Clutter family interview are interviewed and we just have audio of them. I think is it, I think is it Bonnie's granddaughter and great granddaughter maybe? It's, it's Herb's and Bonnie's granddaughter, yeah. Yeah. And they, they, they had children obviously as well that did survive this. And there were a lot of people who I'm sure were very sad that that Truman Capote's portrayal of their mother and grandmother was somebody who they didn't recognize in the book, you know, because yeah. she was a very, very vibrant and engaging and loving and involved mother. And she was taken from them, just yeah. like like Herb, Absolutely. who I was struck in that documentary, you know, Herb. Herb's niece is there talking, Nancy's and Kenyon's first cousin, who was very close with Nancy, and she's talking and says, I was struck how she said, every time I was with Uncle Herb, I just felt safe. Yeah. You just felt safe and protected. And it's like, oh, I know exactly that kind of. Yeah. They were just good, nice, the, loving the photos people. of the family. Like mm -hmm. Herb really honestly has the greatest smile. He oh, looked yeah. like a lot of fun. Yep. It's that's why it's so upsetting and that is why it catches the, the the nation and the world, you know, because you see a family like this that just really are living the literally living the dream. And and then this. Something good? Something good. My something good is that we are um, lucky enough to have a, a an emergency vet clinic nearby. I had to take in jam Two nights ago, he had to stay overnight. It's hopefully nothing too worrisome. He's already back home. He was throwing up a lot. But I'm just, I'm just glad that there are places you can go with your pets nowadays, 24 hours a day in a, in case of an emergency. And I'm glad we're living close by to one of these places and that there are people in this world who work through the night to help all the animals that come Absolutely. In. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. I'm glad he's feeling better. How about you? We took our nieces to see the Boston Ballet's Nutcracker last weekend, oh, and I love it, it was just a delight. They both got so dressed up in their own way, and I saw the photos. It looked great. They had the best time, so that was a real delight for us. We always love that. Every year, the Boston Ballet puts on the Nutcracker, and we went to see it with my aunt Tina, who was over from England ages ago before COVID, and. Now the girls are 10 and 11, so we thought they were sort of old enough, and we were able to get balcony, some good balcony seats, and we got them little opera, gra opera glasses mm -hmm. that they loved, and they just loved it. They absolutely loved it. So I told them when they're older, we'll go and we'll sit closer so that, so that next time they can hear the feet hit the stage and see them sweat and see their, you know, calves flex when they jump and all that stuff. But it was amazing to see it from up high because... They just look like they're floating, and the scene yeah. where it's snowing is just magical. 
If you're in the New England area and have a chance to see the Boston Ballet's performance of The Nutcracker, I highly recommend it. All right. Uh, and that's it. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes, please be so kind and leave us a rating and or review. We love to read them. Go check out our webpage, freshhealthpodcast.com for all further information. Uh, links to our merch store, links to our Patreon. Patreon get together will be on 30th, 30th of December. New Year's Eve Eve. New Year's Eve Eve. <laughs> New Year's. It's New Year's Eve Eve. Join our Facebook group. And that's it. Be kind to all the animals out there. Be kind to human beings at least once. And the most important part of it all, please be kind to yourself. That's absolutely right. Until next week, if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.